Um, my name is Nick Robbins. I'm a professor of practice at the London School of Economics, uh, one of the co-authors of this new second edition of uh, the Toolbox of Sustainable Crisis Response Measures um, with my colleague uh, Simon Dickow, also from the LSE, and also uh, Ulrich Voltz, who's director of the Centre for Sustainable Finance at SOAS, the University of London. Um, this uh, toolbox has been produced as part of the INSPIRE uh, programme, and as you know, INSPIRE stands for the International Network on Sustainable Finance uh, policy insights, research and exchange. And today we're hoping to exchange uh, insights from research with you um, and really think about um, what we can learn from the past uh, year in terms of COVID, uh, climate and sustainability, and particularly to think ahead, uh, to think ahead how uh, central banks um, can uh, act as uh, important anchor institutions in the green and inclusive recovery that we hope will come after this terrible uh, crisis. Uh, sorry uh, for the technical glitch earlier. I hope you're all um, managing to, to join. Um, and uh, we will have a very active discussion um, with first, we'll have uh, a presentation of the uh, findings uh, from the second edition of the toolbox um, from uh, Simon Dickow and Ulrich Voltz. Um, and then we're we'll delighted to have uh, three uh, experts uh, to act as respondents on this, really to think about the implications of the findings, uh, to give their comments, their critique, uh, and also perhaps to, to think ahead um, in terms of what, what could happen next. So first we'll have uh, Irene, Him Irene Himskirk, uh, a senior policy advisor uh, on climate risk and sustainability at uh, the Nederlandse Bank, uh, the Dutch Central Bank, and also advisor to the chair of the NGFS, uh, um, which is uh, obviously very important. And Irene had, has previously worked within the NGFS sector. Then we have uh, Danai uh, Kiriakopoulou, uh, who is the Chief Economist and Director of Research at OMFIF. Um, and also OMFIF obviously has been doing a lot of work uh, recently on sustainability. And then Pierre Monin, a Senior Fellow at the Council on Economic Priorities, and also a member of the uh, INSPIRE uh, Advisory uh, Committee. So uh, after the uh, the panel has made their comments and we've had a discussion obviously there'll be a chance for you all to answer your, ask your questions uh, please do that by raising hand or, or putting comments in the chat um, and we'll have an opportunity hopefully maybe for you to participate uh, uh, verbally in the in the discussion um, while the uh, presentation and the panel discussion is going on um, we'll keep you uh, muted and videos off just so we can uh, focus on the people who are speaking, um, but uh, we can we can lift those uh, later on. Um, so without further ado, sorry, one final thing, the, the, um, uh, this session will be recorded and the link will be uh, made available. So um, without further ado, I'd like to turn over uh, to you, uh, Simon and, and Uli, uh, to take us through the uh, presentation. Uh, Simon, uh, Uli, Uli, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, and uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Simon, can you... Yeah. I have the pleasure to present the uh, second edition of the Toolbox with Simon will be quick. Uh, next slide, please. So, central banks and supervisors have taken extraordinary measures, uh, both in uh, the nature of the response, but also uh, the scale of the responses to the crisis, and uh, these have been very important to stabilize the situation. Um, and now, of course, going forward, uh, they also have to play a very important role in uh, supporting economic uh, recovery. We've seen over the last year um, a strong uh, deepening of the commitment of central banks and supervisors to uh, address climate and other sustainability issues. Um, uh, the NGFS has grown now to, I think by the latest count, 75 uh, members. And uh, so we really see a lot happening in this space. Um, so one can say we're going in the right direction. But um, in this um, uh, second edition of the toolbox, we look at what is actually happening in practice. We, we put forward in June, the first edition of the toolbox where we um, uh, put out an overview of possible measures and, and instruments that central banks and supervisors could take concretely uh, to align their policy responses with sustainability uh, goals. 
Um, and uh, so here we're taking stock. We have a global sample, analysis of a global sample uh, of what's been happening. Uh, and Simon will present that um, in a moment. But um, next slide, please. Let me briefly um, uh, uh, go through uh, what the main rationales are for making sure that uh, central banks and supervisors address sustainability issues in their concrete crisis response measures. And of course, everything, all these arguments are also supporting kind of long-term engagement. But um, this crisis has really brought to the fore the vulnerabilities of our economies and societies. And um, uh, it has shown that we need to be better prepared to deal with systemic risk including climate change uh, and other uh, environmental uh, challenges. And the crisis has also arguably accelerated various fundamental trends in the global economy, um, including um, bringing forward the peak in global oil demand uh, by multiple years. And uh, Simon, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we put forward in the first edition of the toolbox four main reasons why central banks and supervisors really need to um, tackle sustainability issues in their uh, responses and really align them um, with the SDGs and also the, the Paris uh, goals. The first one, uh, very simply, um, is that um, uh, central banks uh, need to make sure that um, uh, their operations and also their balance sheet um, uh, properly reflects and accounts for um, these various sustainability risks. Um, uh, secondly, um, they have, of course, uh, an important role to play to make sure that uh, individ uh, individual financial institutions um, also take these risks into account to ensure um, microprudential uh, stability. Um, but then of course we know that uh, especially climate change also po uh, poses a systemic threat to financial sector stability. Um, so uh, microprudential policy needs to take account of these risks uh, to avoid the build up of new climate risks in the financial system. Um, and um, Fourthly, um, there arguably is a role for central banks and supervisors in supporting uh, broader government efforts uh, to um, help scale up sustainable finance and achieve the SDG and Paris goals. And um, uh, kind of the, the obvious uh, caveat, uh, we're not saying that central banks and supervisors uh, should be uh, the only ones in town uh, who uh, make all this happen, uh, but arguably they have a very important uh, role to play in this. The next slide, please. So just a recap, a uh, box we put forward in uh, June um, uh, provides an overview of a large uh, number of different uh, tools that central banks and supervisors can use um, in a sustainability calibrated way. Uh, so um, the tools are uh, clustered in uh, three different uh, groups. So monetary policy, prudential policy, um, and other policies. And um, we list basically uh, kind of the tools in, in, in their conventional form, which is usually sustainability blind, uh, but also in a sustainability enhanced form. And um, so there are a lot of tools uh, that have been used for the first time by many central banks in their crisis responses. But um, as, as Simon will show now, uh, these have been uh, typically not used in a sustainability calibrated way. And we argue uh, that this is uh, actually very important uh, to avoid the buildup of new uh, uh, climate or sustainability related, related risks going forward. Uh, and with this, uh, I hand over to Simon. Yes, thank you, Uli. So I will, I will briefly discuss what we found in in practice, and then outline our ideas for what the next um, steps could be. 
so how sustainable is the current crisis response in practice? Um, we have investigated the policy response of central banks and, and supervisors in 188 countries. Um, and this is based on the, on the IMF's uh, response to COVID-19 policy tracker. And our key findings are that um, all the instruments or almost all the instruments that are included in the toolbox are currently being used um, as a crisis response measure by, by central banks and supervisors. Although, and this is, this is the crucial point here, not in a sustainability enhanced calibration that, that we are proposing. So uh, generally we have observed that central banks have moved very quickly um, to expand their collateral frameworks, to include a broader variety and quality of assets. And then many central banks and supervisors have also eased counter cyclical cap capital buffers and general micro and macro prudential regulation, um, yeah, specifically micro prudential and supervisory um, standards. Yes, so, so this figure provides an overview of the relative use of the different instruments in the, in the nine categories of the toolbox. I think altogether we looked at around 400 um, policy response instruments in these in these 188 countries and um, yes as you can see with the exception of changes in central bank portfolio management practices which is our category a tool here all instruments have been used and unsurprisingly the adjustment of indirect monetary policy instruments our category two yes our category two here uh, is used is, is the dominant crisis response instrument and this is but yeah this is followed by a change of of microprudential instruments uh, category five in yeah in around 40 percent of the countries and usually these changes are implemented as a as a release of of supervisory requirements here in this category um yeah we think altogether this 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 figure shows um the broad variety of instrument categories from which um financial policy makers have have, have drawn their crisis response so very yeah very broad approach lots of instruments have been used and yeah, what I will discuss next and, and what is important here uh, to note is that the uh, initiatives that fall under our category nine here, uh, supporting sustainable finance are not crisis response related, but these are independent initiatives that have been launched during the time of, of crisis. Um, yes, so now turning to the sustainability dimension, we have found that in only one economy, the monetary authority has explicitly calibrated um, a crisis response instrument in a, what we would call sustainability enhanced way. This is the Reserve Bank of Fiji, which has raised its uh, crisis response import substitution and export finance facility um, to provide credit to, to renewable energy businesses at a concessional rate. Yeah, at a concessional rate. Um, yes, however, as shown in the figure, central banks and supervisors in 40 economies, 21% of the total, uh, have taken steps to address sustainable finance and yeah, or implement related policy policies in parallel to, to their crisis response. And yeah, as mentioned before, these are not direct crisis response measures. Um, with regard to regional trends, we found that central banks and supervisors in Europe and East Asia have been most active in, in, in terms of introducing these parallel sustainability measures and yeah heavily skewed towards high income uh, towards central banks and supervisors in high income in high income countries okay so yeah looking forward priority areas for integrating sustainability factors so generally with the toolbox we want to provide a framework for categorizing the range of measures that central banks and supervisors can take to to support a sustainable um, recovery and to ensure that their crisis response uh, measures do not have unintended consequences in terms of enhancing climate and other sustainability risks. So this is, this is our general aim here. And it will, of course, be important to, to do further research on these and to explore in greater tech, as Nick mentioned, in greater technical details how this, how this can be done in the future. And we like to think um, that the updated toolbox provides a starting point for achieving this, this integration of sustainable finance policies um, of sustainable in, in the crisis response frameworks. And we would like to highlight these four priority areas here where the, where the discussion could start. Uh, first, amending collateral frameworks to account for climate change related and other environmental risks. 
This is because a lot of central banks have moved very quickly to expand their collateral framework. So why not also take account of these risks? Um, secondly, removing the carbon bias within corporate asset purchase programs and align refinancing operations with Paris Agreement goals. Um, again, because a lot of central banks have moved very quickly to expand these programs, we would like to um, see these, uh, these, these, these other goals um, implemented here. Then third, adjusting prudential measures to minimize climate risk and strengthen disclosure of, um, yeah, disclosure and stress testing requirements. And then finally, adopting sustainable, responsible <clears throat> investment principles for portfolio management, including policy portfolios. Uh, my last slide. Yes, so in, in terms of next steps, we think that it would now be important to bring together these two largely separate tracks of crisis response and on the other hand, um, sustainability commitments. And regarding the easing and credit expansion policies, it would be important that sustainability considerations are incorporated to avoid, yeah, to, to avoid a significant expansion of, of lending to economic sectors that are not aligned with, with economies transition plans. And under these yeah, in ambitious transition plans, this expansion could constitute a significant investment in essentially stranded assets. That's, that's the danger here. Then uh, the widespread and undifferentiated counter-cyclical release of regulation and supervisory expectations in face of significant transition and also physical risks is very problematic. And we would argue that if prudential measures are released, assets um, and related exposure to sectors that are bearing the highest transition risks should be exempt from this release. Um, then, well, the NGFS and as well as national central banks and supervisors have made significant progress in expanding their capacity and knowledge on climate change and related risks this year. And um, the implementation of these measures that are being discussed should be brought forward and be applied to the, to the crisis response measures. Is, is an important point here. And then finally, further dialogue and analysis is needed to explore how, how, yeah, how well-established approaches such as the market neutrality principle can be updated in light of, of market failure, such as climate change and last but not least, biodiversity loss. And with this, I would, yes, with this, I would like, back, uh, I would like to hand back to Nick and, and our panelists. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Uli and Simon. Thanks for, for that, uh, that analysis. And I think um, really we want to sort of look at uh, some of the findings you presented and uh, then uh, also um, really sort of take account of what you put on the last slide about actually this potential for, um, for convergence. Um, so I think we can probably end the screen share now and just have people instead, um, which is always nicer. Um, and the first person um, I'd like to turn to is yourself, uh, Irene, um, from the DMB. Um, you've been really at the, at, the, at the heart of a lot of this agenda over the past uh, year, and I really welcome your reflections on this research and also where we are in the, the evolution of, of, of practice around uh, greening the financial system. So Irene, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Nick, uh, for inviting me to this uh, to this meeting on uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, pleased to meet everyone again. Um, I think, uh, and and thanks so much for the work Inspire has been doing on this because I think we've been voicing the importance from green recovery since uh, well, since uh, quite soon after the the pandemic hit uh, most of the world. But it's it's uh, I think the the progress report you published uh, today is really shows okay what what else can we do as central banks and supervisors so it's it's been really helpful to work with you on this uh, and to see the results when i read through the um, to the document uh, the thing that came to my mind is um, did the pandemic arrive too early or are we too late <laughs> a bit like that because on uh, in one hand you see that um there are so many good things um, set out in, in the document, uh, but I think some of them also take, still take a bit of time to really adapt them in our work on, uh, on the crisis responses. And ideally, you would have this all in place and then, then have a pandemic crisis and you, you'll be set up. So that, that's uh, what came to my mind when I read it, but still, I think this, uh, we're, we're, we're unfortunately still facing uh, the, 
the effects of the pandemic crisis. So we're not, we're, it's not over yet. So this is this is not too late. The work we, we're doing. If I look at the um, uh, the, the four uh, action priority action points uh, that you set out, uh, the the first two amending collateral frameworks and removing the carbon bias uh, with corporate assess, uh, asset purchase programs. I think these are this is um, really still much under debate. I'm 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 pleased to see that, that there has been a bit of a movement like like now we're not talking uh, anymore about uh, that uh, this is this is not an issue I think even like uh, the interview Jens Weidman gave a few weeks or the opinion he said in the FT a few weeks ago um, about this topic also that the European Central Bank is uh, incorporating this in their strategic review the coming months um, I think these are these are signs that um, uh, central banks are starting to take this seriously and see how how, can, how they can move forward with it. Um, for the other points on uh, how you really incorporate it in your prudential framework, I think here uh, within the NGFS we've seen of course that many members uh, are moving up on this. And also the publication last Friday of the European Central Bank with their guide for uh, for uh, with expectations on climate related and environmental risk, what financial institutions should do, and also the ambitious follow up tied to that, uh, that they're really going to look how uh, banks and insurance banks um, uh, incorporated this in the, in the coming year. And they also are looking closer to the disclosure topic. I think here, uh, I think here there are big movements. And with the NGFS membership growing uh, still, uh, Uli mentioned 75, well, yes, it is, and we're still growing. So I think this is a sign that more and more um, central banks and supervisors are taking it very seriously. The, the other thing is that it's not just the NGFS anymore, it's the FSB, it's the BCBS, the IAIS, um, IOSCO, and I think it's also important to mention here the work the IFRS uh, will be starting uh, with launching their consultation on um, a sustainable reporting framework. I think this is an important next step as well to, to have all the pieces together on this topic so we can really move forward with um, uh, on, the, on our prudential side. And the last topic that's on the on the priority list is adapting sustainable and responsible inf investment principles for portfolio management. Um, I'm pleased to say that in a few weeks time, uh, the NGFS will publish a progress report. So last October 2019, they published an, a sustainable re responsible investment guide for uh, central banks on their uh, portfolio, on their reserve management. And now they're, they're publishing a progress report and, and yeah, it, it's good to to see that we have movement there as well. We will publish the result, of course, more in detail. But I, I also see there a positive trend. So to sum up, I think the the work we're doing, um, you you have been doing, contributes us and and uh, keeps us a bit uh, sharp to 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 look into the, all the options we have. Um, uh, we try to contribute within the NGFS and beyond to to really move forward on this topic, and I, I'm I'm also pleased to see it's it's not that we're just we're really trying to do both at the same time, um, uh, responding to the crisis and building a, a, a more sustainable economy. So I think that's a, that's quite unique because usually people are distracted of the moment of the day, and now I think we're, we're still looking to the future. So I'm looking forward to the discussion with all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Irene. That's very, very thoughtful. I think this idea that actually that the sort of the for in terms of the crisis response and climate change, perhaps the pandemic um, uh, came a little bit too early. That actually climate change wasn't yet totally instinctive in terms of response. Uh, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a comment. And very interesting to come back. Maybe to, to maybe some of what are the the practical in the discussion, some of what are the practical themes that we would need to focus on to, to enable that. Um, and then, yeah, it'd be really interesting maybe in discussion to think about um, the points you made about the portfolio management. Um, obviously a number of, on these sort of 
private finance side, a lot of uh, asset owners are setting net zero targets. So it'd be interesting to think about that and what that means for central banks. And then you set out all this all this acronym uh, blizzard of all these different different names. But it does mean that we've got to think, particularly in terms of a sustainable recovery. Obviously, this sort of systemic response. All those authorities you mentioned, BIS and FSB and IOSCU, um, IFRS, and as well as obviously the finance ministers, and particularly I think in the G20 next 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 year. So thank you, thank you for so much for setting that out. Um, I'm going to turn uh, from the Netherlands, where we've got some wonderful trees in the background, uh, to you, Dan. I think in, in, in London. Um, and Dan, over to you. Obviously, Omar Omfif has really been stepping up your work on, on sustainability. I'd really like to get your feedback on this uh, toolbox. So over to you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thanks for inviting me to take part here. It's great to uh, be on this panel with you all. And uh, congratulations on the publication of the second edition of the toolbox. I think it's a very impressive document of work um, to all of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And uh, I think my reaction to it was, uh, wow, so few central banks are actually aligning their crisis response to uh, sustainability. I think the slides that um, Simon and, and Uli presented are quite a wake up call because on the timing, we are seeing that yes, this is a big opportunity to really not go back with so many stimulus programs to the economy that we had before, because it's, we are increasingly realizing that it's not sustainable. Um, and I think it would be a very, very huge shame if that opportunity is wasted. I was also thinking a lot about the timing and have been thinking about it quite intensely and, and reading this, this report. Um, so it's interesting that Irene brought that up as well. I think there's two ways to look at that. On the one hand, it is good timing because there has been, there had been quite a lot of momentum on the sustainability agenda. So when COVID hit, I think the intellectual framework to interpret this as here is the source of a non-financial risk that is having systemic financial impacts on the, on the economy was immediate. Everyone got that. And it was kind of sharpening the awareness that yes, we need to protect ourselves against similar risks in the future, whether that is climate change, whether that is loss of biodiversity, and also not see these things in isolation, but see them holistically. On the other hand, I think it did come a little bit too early because we haven't yet made the full progress on things like disclosures, taxonomies, we are closed. So in that sense, it wasn't that bad timing, but I think if we already had the taxonomies there, if we had already, some of these measures were already there, it, could, it would have been much easier to just implement sustainable policy responses. Um, but it's good that, that at least we have the opportunity to do that in the next two to three years, perhaps. Um, I think given that we are seeing central banks step in, not just in um, advanced economies, which is what we saw in the previous crisis, a lot of quantitative easing programs, for example, which are one of the areas that, that the report highlights where sustainability can be part of it. The corporate bond purchase programs, for example, um, the QE programs, we're now seeing a lot of emerging markets do that as well. And I think that is something new in this crisis where there is a, an opportunity to integrate sustainability. I think when we think about the, the rationale for central banks to do that, I think the report does that very well. I think it's important that it differentiates between the kind of risk uh, motivation that it's about protecting uh, central bank balance sheets against the potential market failure and the potential climate Minsky moment as it's called where um, um, stranded assets will lose value and so on. I think you do make the point in the report that central banks do have the power to protect themselves against that if they if they want to by uh, printing more money, etc. But I think I think the report makes that point well. The other um, argument of aligning themselves with government policy, I think that's the more controversial one where we are seeing debates now. Um, you mentioned also before, uh, and Irene mentioned also about the, the market neutrality question. And I think the, the way to do that and the, the lens through which to view it is that governments have already committed to the Paris Agreement. Um, it's not a political, an active political choice that central banks are making. They're simply aligning themselves with the political choices in the countries in which they operate. So in, in a way, it can also be viewed the other way. If they don't align themselves, then that is a political uh, choice because they're going against what, what the policies um, of the elected um, uh, representatives are are pointing to. Then, in terms of the of the tools, um, oh, sorry, of the of the what next and the and the priorities that the report sets out. I think on the on the question about uh, removing 
uh, dealing with carbon intensive industries, perhaps, and kind of making sure that lending to such sectors is minimized, and that if there are no if there is no transition focus, they are not part of the portfolios, or or that central banks uh, regulate banks in a way that that loans to such sectors are lowered. I think that that goal will be easier to achieve in the future because up to now we didn't really have the data to really identify. Um, how each particular company uh, or sector is is making is making that transition, and so the choice was a very black and white one of either you divest um, or you you take the market principle and therefore you you because it's part of the market. I think now with more advances in data, uh, we will be able to target more specific companies and not just exclude because they're in a dirty industry but uh, help them transition with a big win. And I think that will be a difficult thing for central banks to do in their own portfolios because they, they don't yet have in their toolbox opportunity in the same as transfer equity shares and can um, uh, use their voting rights to steer a company in a more sustainable direction. We're talking about climate change, but there's also other... Uh, uh, other factors when it comes to sustainability, things like inequalities, things like governance, diversity in governance, for example, we have seen also the pandemic affecting uh, different groups of society differently, increasing inequalities and so on. Um, and I think that will be a bit more difficult for central banks to do, but for the broader financial sector, it will be what it was before. Uh, and I think that's the same with portfolio management. Uh, and I think that's also a tricky one because I, I, I've seen the guide that Irene was talking about that, that the NGFS will publish uh, soon. And, and it's, it sets out some good principles, but at the same time, when you think about central banks in, in total, their reserves, their foreign exchange reserves are around $14 trillion collectively. So they are investors with large holdings. They cannot exclude uh, and then still have assets to, to invest in. They even don't invest in equities. Um, so that does buy very much. But if you if you exclude certain sectors in total and you're a big investor, then there's not that much left for you to invest in. At the same time, invest in sustainable asset classes is also not as much as a, of an option now because they may be crowding out invest because they're very supply of sustainable assets. So the green bond market, for example, is very small compared to the overall fixed income market. So if, if central banks want to invest actively in sustainable investment products, there's just not enough of them there right now. And it's, the supply should grow as well. So I think that's where we need to do more work going forward. I think the report sets the right priorities. I think the, the rethinking of the, in the strategic reviews, for example, of the principle of market neutrality is an important one as well. And it's great that the report highlights that. Um, so I think we are on the right way. The advances in, in data and the realization also for a lot of investors that uh, this is not just for a reputation, but it's for the risk in our portfolios, and that includes the central banks, is the right way forward. Thank you. Dana, thanks so much uh, for that. I think that's, that's really interesting. As you were talking particularly about the portfolio management, I was struck one of the research areas um, which Inspire is working on, I know that um, many on people on the call are always working on is the area of, of sovereign bonds. And clearly at the moment, one of the, the things we've seen is an extraordinary issuance in, in, in sovereign bonds uh, by um, fiscal authorities, obviously to, to pay, uh, to keep the economy going, to keep livelihoods going and businesses going. And obviously central banks are, are large holders of, of these sovereign bonds. So really sort of thinking ahead that actually, yes, um, we have, I don't know, 16 or so countries which are with green sovereign bonds. But if we're thinking between now and 2050, then all sovereign bonds need to be, if we're just talking about climate change, need to be aligned with net zero. So there could be a quite an interesting dynamic and not necessarily buying this tiny slice of green, but actually that fiscal monetary coordination, ensuring that over time, that those holdings are actually aligned with net zero. So I think that'd be quite an interesting, quite a strategic uh, approach that could, could go forward. Uh, so Dano, thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you also, I think also we, 
we mentioned, we heard, and I think in, in your presentation, Simon, earlier, also this question of uh, developing and emerging economies. And maybe we can come back to the, that in, in, in discussion, because clearly, um, as, as Uli has done in another report, there are also concerns about sort of a, sort of a debt uh, stress that's rising up in this agenda. So we might want to come back to that. But Dana, thank you uh, so much. Um, and for our last uh, respondent, um, uh, before we go more to a discussion, um, Pierre, we're going to we're going to go uh, south uh, and head to the mountains and go to to you in Switzerland. Uh, so, Pierre, um, your your thoughts. Uh, also, doing great work at CEP, uh, but also you're a member of the uh, Inspire Advisory Council. So, um, very good to hear your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, and then, first, congratulations for the for the work done uh, with this report. I think uh, I mean you. It's a very extensive extensive review of, of what have been has been happening. It's it's really full of useful information for everybody working on central bank and sustainability. So I really recommend uh, its reading. Um, what I would like to reflect a bit is uh, the lessons that we can learn from COVID and that your report also highlights, and and the lesson that we can learn for. Uh, Let's say the next crisis to come, the climate climate crisis. I think we've been through a, a live experiment of a transition shock, very sudden and very sharp, with with uh, with the COVID uh, crisis. So we went from a perfectly functioning economy to an almost total lockdown, and and we've seen what transition shocks, uh, if not managed well, how disruptive they can be, and and. And with climate change, we're going to have a transition as well. So whether it's a business as usual, we're going to live in a totally different new world, five degrees uh, hotter. It's it's a transition to another another planet. Or we're going to transition to a low carbon economy, and then we have to also totally readapt uh, our way of producing things. And and so this is a transition shock as well, uh, and it might be not as sudden as uh, as the covid the, the covid shock but uh, it we need to keep in mind that that it will be accelerating so the effect of climate change will, what we see will be accelerating now when it comes to the reaction of central bank what i think it's a, what i think is interesting is that we've seen it's large scale and it was everywhere in the world and that's also a the same thing for climate change. It's going to be a large shock, probably with also the implication that central bank will have to be to have large reaction, and it's everywhere in the world. All central banks do that. What we also have seen with um, with the reaction to the COVID crisis is that central bank have used a lot of more of the same, more asset purchases, uh, work with collateral, uh, refinancing operation at larger scale. Uh, and and I will come back on that later. But we also have seen some creativity or things, some 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 borders that have, that have been uh, passed, like you know the Bank of England uh, financing the the government directly with the way and means facilities. Or I think the Fed now is also sent like lending lending directly to firms. Right? So so that's and I think we need some creativity for for the for for climate change as well. Now, for everything that is more of the same, asset purchases, collateral, prudential policy, uh, targeted refinancing operation, everything that has been used to fight the COVID, we have green solutions. Um, whether, and, and these solutions are, are, are been examined by central bank. They've been, I mean, they, they are on the table since three, four years. So. In three, four years, we say, you know, integrate climate risk in prudential regulation, you know, uh, change your collateral, uh, better target your refinancing operations. So, so for all these tools, and the way they've been, they've been, they've been used in the COVID crisis is totally in line with with some of the suggestions that are on the table now. So it's, it shows that it it basically works. Now. Last thing that I would like to, to highlight is the COVID crisis has, has highlighted that we, we better to be prepared 
to last, last uh, big shocks. And and um, and it's bet. I mean, we we know the kind of reaction central banks can do if we prepare in advance the technical solution for the implementation. Also, like you know, a lot of criteria need to be in place. Who who will benefit for for from 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 the helps and thing like that. So I think it's better to 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 think in advance uh, and and, uh, and and be prepared for that. Uh, and, and especially because clim climate shock, whether it's transition or physical, they they large scale. They're, and and the NGF has highlighted it. They are foreseeable. We know that they will happen, whether it's higher physical risk and less transition risk or the opposite. So the NGF has said, highlighted it's foreseeable and it's irreversible. It will happen. So we have no excuse not to be prepared there. The good news. I would say is that um, so the, the, the climate shock will not be as as abrupt as as COVID shock. So um, you know you 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 can have you can have time to to uh, implement policies that for central banks and financial regulators progressively to introduce them so slowly. It's not going to be uh, in, in in one month like in. Uh, so, so you can do it progressively and slowly, but you have to keep in mind that to change the path we are in, we have to act now. So it's not because you can do it slowly that you should not start very soon. Um, and, and also, I think it's very, it's, it's totally, it makes sense for central bank to, to do it because if you start to adapt now, then you smooth the shock and, and that's, you know, you, you are the smoothest shocks to price stability, to financial stability. So it's really in the in the essence of central bank to do something like that. Now, when it comes to your and that's what, that will be my last point. When it's come to the solution that uh, that uh, you put forward and uh, the priority that you set, I would I would put a high priority on integrating climate risk into monetary policy operation and and uh, prudential regulation. So we know so. First, managing risk, it's in the mandate of the of central banks uh, for, for financial stability reasons, but also for their own balance sheet. It's, it's good practice for central bank to have a sound balance sheet and, and uh, select the risk they take. So it's not a question of mandate, it's really a normal practice of central bank. And then for risk, I think the situation is clear. We have with the NGFS and, and the FSB and others have, have identified this risk. They say it's large, it's a risk. So uh, banks are exposed to this risk. Plus there is a clearly identified market um, failure there in terms of climate change. So, so we could be in front of, 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 sharp, of sharp repricing. So there, is, so there is a need to realign the financial sector to decrease this risk, better manage it. And that's, and I think that's, that can be done through through uh, prudential regulation, but also in policies that that in incentivize banks to decrease their risk exposure. And last point, I think central banks balance sheet, as any balance sheet, is also exposed to this to this climate risk. And and I mean that's something that I think that I will that I will agree with. It's a, it's a no brainer for them. To better to better reflect this climate in their operation in, in the huge portfolio that they have now uh, and and for that there is no excuse for no action the data are there so we just we, we will publish this week a report showing that that uh, we have um, a risk assessment available for firms uh, risk climate risk uh, exposure assessment and we have, we have you know several of these assessments and these assessments what we found is that they tend to converge on on identifying the risky firms and, and the safe firms so so they are usable and you, you can you can today start into working with them and and, and and use them in in your in your decisions that's what i wanted to say well pierre i'm very glad you said that because i think it was, it was it was very very wise, I thought, actually. Um, and 
Maybe uh, just, I think you said there's no excuse for inaction in, in your last uh, few sentences. And I, I'm just like, sort of um, thinking now about our participants, um, just for no excuse for your inaction either. Um, so please get thinking about questions that you would like to ask. But I've got a few really from listening uh, to the, uh, the, both the presentation, Uli and Simon from yourself, and also to Irene and Danai and, uh, and, and, to, uh, and to you, Pierre. I suppose the, the first question, uh, maybe sort of building on where we started with, with, uh, with the toolbox and, and with yourself, Irene, your comments, is sort of, I think we've identified some of the sort of, certainly some of the tools that um, need to be taken as a, as a matter of priority. But perhaps where are the sort of the practical issues that would need to be resolved? I think Pierre, in your last comments, you were saying that actually there are sort of green versions of these mechanisms, refinancing or collateral or asset purchase that have been uh, proposed, but they haven't quite landed yet. Um, and I suppose it would be interesting to um, identify sort of some of those issues. So I don't know, um, Uli or Simon, whether you have any reflections or I'm going to ask the panelists as well, your reflections there. And then, then the other question I'd like to come back on, I know we're, we're all sitting here in, in Europe, but I'd like really also maybe some reflections on sort of some of the issues for central banks and supervisors in other parts of the world. But this is this question first, perhaps, in terms of uh, some of the sort of the, the really practical issues. Uli and Simon, I'm going to come to you, then, then go to the panel with you, starting with you, Irene. Yeah, uh, thank you, Simon, and, and thanks everyone for, for really very thoughtful, very good comments. I, I think on the issue of, you know, how ready are all these measures and tools to, to be implemented? I would say, um, of course, the devil is in the details. So, so, you know, kind of central banks, supervisors want to be very careful in, in you know, whatever new measures they implement. But at the same time, uh, I think we, we really, um have a problem in so far as uh, there has been always the discussion going on for many years now oh we need more granular uh, more granular data we need more you know detail on this and that to really understand how how if we should be doing how we should be doing it and in principle i agree but at the same time uh, there really is a very large urgency in all that so uh, Pierre alluded to that. I mean, Pierre said, uh, you know, we, we, we have more, or central bank supervisors have more time to, to shape their uh, responses to climate change than they had, you know, uh, to respond in responding to the uh, COVID crisis. I mean, that was really like overnight decisions that had to be taken. Um, but, uh, you know, we have been now, uh, having these discussions on 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 what central bank supervisors should be doing for a couple of years and of course the the discussion has advanced a lot but i do feel we now have a relatively good understanding of the main issues so uh, some very basic principles and and i think um uh you know i mean um uh, let's say when it comes to to um asset uh, purchase uh, programs um, I think that it's beyond doubt that certain types of assets, you know, are uh, at much higher risk of, of being stranded. And uh, of course, you know, there are different shades of green and so on. But, but uh, for example, uh, central banks um, excluding um, uh, fossil fuel um, assets, uh, I think that that, that doesn't really uh, take a lot of um, sophistication. Yeah? Um, and it, I mean, more than anything, it would, would send a very important signal. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the central bank balance sheet, um, if you look at corporate uh, um, asset uh, purchases, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's actually not that important. And, and central banks will not go bankrupt because of, you know, having some stranded assets uh, from fossil fuel companies in there. But I think it's really more about the principle. Uh, central bank supervisors have been very clear uh, in, in, in pointing out two significant uh, financial stability risks, and, and um, uh, they have been demanding from financial institutions to uh, take these risks into account. So they need to be leading by example. They need to integrate uh, these risks into their own operations. 
and of course also monetary operations. Um, and uh, so I would say uh, one part is really the signaling um, yep. and, and some very basic uh, actions can already help quite a lot in that respect. But then, sorry, and then some very concrete actions, you know, um, uh, 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 mandatory disclosure, uh, you know, uh, uh, mandatory stress testing and so on. Okay, we may not have the perfect uh, climate stress test yet, but we have, I mean, the MGFS has published uh, two months ago a volume with, you know, really good examples, 39 examples uh, from different financial institutions and, and, and um, you know, there's a lot. And, and so this can be uh, directly implemented um, and it would send a very important signaling effect uh, and it would really force everyone in the financial sector to, to get their act together now. Okay, thanks, Sully. Um, Simon, you, you've been really in the engine room of this, this report and sort of reflecting. I mean, you're just maybe before I move on to you, Irene, so any thoughts, particularly on this sort of what might be some of the bottlenecks, practical issues, which may be uh, sort of holding up this convergence? Clearly, lots of central banks committing to climate action, but not yet applied to crisis response directly. Um, Simon, any, any thoughts? Yes, yeah, maybe to, to pick up on something that Dane and, and, and Pierre mentioned. Um, I mean, it is very interesting that not just in emerging markets, but also in advanced economy, the uh, economies, the central, a lot of central banks moved very quickly to support employment in, in with regard to supporting SMEs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one obvious re reason for this is that it's very easy to identify SMEs, for example, just by the number of employees. And um, so this is something a lot of central banks just did they just supported smes and i mean you could call this i mean of course they did this with different instruments for some of them this was clearly a directed policy or they directed banks to lend to smes or others just created incentives but it was very easy to identify this um i mean i would argue that to some degree the uh, the european taxonomy of sustainable um, of, of sustainable activities provides a nice framework to to identify which of these activities are sustainable. So, I mean, if central banks showed us that they can support certain sectors, the SME sector, why not combine this with with an assessment um, to identify which of these are sustainable? And this is this is not just so. I mean, this is something we 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 see, of course, in emerging markets. A lot of central banks promote certain sectors, but this is now also something we saw across the board. So a lot of central banks supported SMEs, and but Danae is absolutely right. Identifying what is green is is difficult, but the EU taxonomy provides a, a starting point. And then just to respond to to Torsten's um, comment here in the in the chat, um, I think collateral framework. The collateral framework changes are something very central to look at. If <clears throat> if transition risks are something that could be, I mean, this could be a starting point to just just focus on transition risks, not do any direct, um, I, I don't know, not do any promotional or qualitative um, changes of the of the collateral framework, but just try to somehow account for transition risks to kick out those assets that that really carry a high risk. So this could be a starting point to look at, at, at collateral frameworks. And of course, this would then tickle down through monetary policy, um, apply to all the policy portfolios of central banks. So this could be a very powerful step. Thanks very much, Simon. I, I think what, what's interesting to me at the moment is looking at uh, maybe investor practice and how that is shifting um, towards really asking the companies they invest in for credible uh, evidence of uh, net zero transition plans. So not just looking at where the companies were last year in terms of their emissions, but where they're going to be with regard to their emissions and their products and, and business models for 2030 and 2050. And I think that would be a forward looking signal that central banks can send that actually what they're looking for obviously is companies to be aligned with those, those pathways rather than just what, what they did um, last year. So Irene, maybe, and I'm gonna turn to the panel on this, just your reflections again, as, as, a, as, a, as a practitioner within a central bank on some of these sort of really sort of practical things that would need uh, to be addressed um, uh, so that central banks had confidence to make these linkages. And again, I suppose not, and, and again, practical in the sense of sort of where, where we could actually start the process and then sort of learning by doing. But any reflections on you, from you, Irene? Yeah, thanks. It's, it's been really interesting listening to, to everyone and um, yeah, I've been thinking a bit from from the practical issues. The, um, 
one of them, yeah, I, I do come with a bit of the list of uh, usual suspects, I have to say, with the disclosures, of course, uh, being, I think, being identified as a really important one. And and I, I really like the uh, example, I think it's in your, um, I think it, it was in your uh, toolbox as well, what, what Canada did on the TCFD requirements, uh, disclosure requirements, if they support, right, to have these kind of elements really integrated um, and why why I start with disclosures is that uh, it it really will help um, central banks uh, and supervisors I'm, I'm I'm taking it more from the supervisory uh, aspects here to to really I'd better identify the the risk or the financial institutions can better identify the risk and then uh, the supervisors can do that so we need better disclosures on the on through the whole uh, program and then the other thing I think we touched on was the the mispricing of these risks, right? Um, and I do want to emphasize again that the CO introducing a CO two price at some point could really be be helpful, but this is I don't think this is a practical solution because it will take so many um, many people involved to to really decide on this. But yeah, I, th I think the from the supervisor side, we're just trying to move ahead um, we're, we're looking into okay what what are the risks identifying it and and thinking about exclusion maybe we should do that a bit a uh, bit more in detail as well uh, to really see can we exclude certain sectors will that help but to have a bit of a policy backing there could uh, uh, and a clear transition path could could really help so that, those are my short uh, reflections and I think a bit uh, more uh, in the meantime, I, mean, I think the disclosure point, and I see that sort of uh, it's, uh, there's some good discussion in the chat on this. I think the disclosure point is, is good, and actually, I think maybe making the linkages, um, let's say, between, between the provision of, of, of financing through monetary operations to, to at least um, disclosure and perhaps more, I think would be good because then that would really align the incentives. Uh, I think that's very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Danai, Pierre, anything more on these sort of practical? Um, barriers that we need to bust in the next few months? I mean, again, and I'm talking the next few months, these aren't long-term research projects, but actually uh, this is this crisis is still with us. But um, can I, Pierre? Yes, thanks, Nick. Uh, I think actually Uli's res uh, response to that was excellent and very comprehensive. I agree with a lot of what he said, uh, and I'm aligned with that. I think it's very important for central banks to stress in the coming months and to take really that approach that we shouldn't make the perfect the enemy of the good because if you look at what are the stumbling blocks why are we seeing in your report that so few central banks are doing that what is stopping them they have joined the ngfs they have recognized that these are risks so why are we not moving ahead and um i think one of the things that that come up again and again is that we do not have enough data we do not have enough information we cannot introduce green supporting factors for example because we don't have proof that green is risk um, we don't have the taxonomies. And I think I like a quote from former executive board member of the ECB, Sabine schedules. Um, so it's important to some things that are very, very obvious. I mean, Uli gave the example of fo fossil fuels in, in portfolios, right? And I think it's it's about what can we already do now? And, and also, how do we present the, the rationale for central banks to take this action? Is it, and, and I think being very rigorous about that also in their communications, that it is because of the risk would really help because you still see a lot of central bankers come out and say, but we don't wanna be involved in politics, but government should introduce a carbon price. Yes, this is all correct, but I think the way you communicate also matters. And if we spend all of our energy talking about this will damage our independence, this will get us into politics, um, they are public institutions, they are in the public eye, but I think they should be emphasizing that there are some things that they can already do. Um, and I think on the exclusions, we will have now more data, as I said in my original inter intervention, which means that they will be able to, to zoom more closely into exactly which activities of these companies uh, we, we can focus on. One thing on disclosures, because this has been mentioned a lot, I think we need to be a little bit more careful about that because I think there is a trade-off there and you want to make sustainable finance and the progress very inclusive. And I think disclosure sometimes is 
something that you need to, you need to be careful how you bring everyone on board. For example, emerging markets, SMEs that may not necessarily have the resources and the capacity to comply with disclosure requirements. So I think it's not a magic wand where you make them mandatory and you have the information. Um, I've done various discussions with the also development banks that are very hands-on on this in emerging markets, for example, the EBRD that is doing a lot of work on that. And when you hear how they work on the ground, it's very difficult for a lot of, say, a financial institution in Morocco, how do they get the data on the, the, the sustainability risks? These are very expensive data at the moment for corporates to get the information and to kind of do the modeling for their own activities. Again, it's something that, that they need to be supported. So I don't think disclosures is just a straightforward answer like this. It's important we get there, yeah. but I think we need to think harder about how. I think that's really, really, really profound, actually. I've been working on disclosure for too many years, and I think sometimes there is a, a mood in the market that we can't take decisions until we have all the information. Um, all financial decisions are about the future, which are inherently uncertain. Um, and I think we need to recognize better disclosure is good, um, but actually we're gonna work, we're gonna have to take decisions in uncertainty, dealing with foreseeable risks. And I think actually sometimes the focus on disclosure can make people delay action, which uh, obviously is not what we want to do. So I think that's a, a wise comment. Pierre, a quick, quick thought from you on the practical issues, and then I'm gonna to turn to some of the people who've uh, raised their hands and asked some questions. Yeah, just a quick remark on, I think if you want to see, um, I, th I think a lot of the inaction uh, from, from in, in, in terms of policy making also comes from a, a confusion that there is in the discussion. I think people tend, and central bankers, tends to mix like the, a, a risk management issue and a policy coherent issue, I would say. Mm. So there are propositions that are really uh, about how to manage climate risk in their balance sheet, in the financial sectors. And there are propositions that say, you should align your policy on, on, on broader objectives like, uh, like climate change. And I think for the second one, I agree whether it's just the central bank role to do that or not, there is a discussion about the mandate. You know, if you want to have like, like um, how do you say, pro proactive measure in that direction, I understand that there is, a, that there is a, a discussion and some reluctance to do that. But on the risk management aspect, I don't understand that. It's, it's uh, yeah, and, 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 and there is no excuse not, not, to, not, not to start now because of course, we don't have the perfect data, but we have data. I mean, I've been working now uh, with with uh, risk assessment, climate risk assessment uh, um, providers. You are, you have tens of them that gives uh, that give data, and, and it's not precise, of course. But you are, I think, in our situation, you have to work with a precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's better to use something that is a bit uh, wrong than say we can't use it and, and therefore we don't take this risk into account. That is a mistake. Putting a zero risk on something on something that where we know there is a risk is a mistake. It's better to, it's better to use in precise in, in precise uh, um, statistics that we have. Yeah. Of course. I, I agree with you, Nick, better data is always good, but but uh, until we have this bet, better data, they, they, there are steps to take. That's right. No, I think that, that's um that's that's very good, particularly where we have market failures. There's not there's, there. This is not priced. So um, very good. So we have some some people asking questions. That's great. Um, Adam uh, Pauloff or Pauloff. Um, I don't know, Adam, if you want to unmute and ask your question, and then I'll take it in turn. I think Torsten, I'd like you to ask your question uh, verbally by voice. It's always nice. And I think we have uh, Monica De Leo as well. But if you if you want to unmute. Um, and uh, ask uh, Natasha if you need to help, please do so. So um, first, over to you, Adam. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nick, and uh, and thanks to everyone. Really, uh, really interesting session um, this morning. Just a couple of brief comments, um, and then a couple of questions. I mean, couldn't agree more with what both Dane and Pierre said uh, said just a minute ago. Um, I mean, we've been putting a lot of focus on on the issue of market neutrality. Um, as of late, and, and also good to see our our report reflected in that. And I think that is that argument is certainly beginning to gain some some traction, where you just see how 
you know, market failure, particularly with regard fossil fuels, is is quite pre prevalent um, in central banks' balance sheets. And and maybe as an FYI, we're going to be producing something quite similar yeah. in January on collateral frameworks. Okay. So, quick, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, sure. The the questions uh, would be on the one hand. So Fiji was pointed out as one of as a central bank that has taken measures. Um, I'm wondering, I've heard about Sweden, and I know this is sort of only a light touch measure in terms of emissions intensity with regard to their corporate um, uh, bond purchases, whether that's been taken into account, and also wondering on the priorities about differential capital requirements um, as, uh, as an issue. Thanks. And Adam, sorry, we didn't, I didn't give you the chance to introduce yourself, maybe to say where you're from, sorry. Uh, sure. I uh, work for uh, for Greenpeace and lead our work on the European great. Central Bank. Thanks so much, Adam. That's, that's great. So, so questions there on on, on, uh, on, on Sweden and um, differential measures. Was that the second one? Yeah. Thanks so much, Adam. So, uh, Torsten Ehlers, um, I don't know if you want to jump in with your, your question or follow up. Um, uh, yeah. Hi. 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 Good morning, Nick. Um, and, and thanks. This is really, really interesting work. It's, it, it's a great report. I think this is... Uh, this is something that um, that will be watched by central banks and others, I think. Uh, and it's I think it's good to have um, a list of things that you know central banks can do. So my my question is uh, one on prioritization. So you have outlined this toolbox. You know, different tools are available. Uh, most central banks, I think, by now are aware of it. But of course, there, there are. I, I do think. Uh, there are capacity constraints and and perhaps that would uh, call for uh, prioritizing and perhaps concentrating on on some measures that we want to implement first um so i i, I was wondering how how you guys uh, think about that thank you very good uh, question thanks so much and then the last question from uh, monica de leo monica over to you please yeah so much to the panelists. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of New York. Before this, I was at the New York Fed, so I kind of moved to this from a very new perspective. Um, yeah, so my question is just looking back to the global financial crisis. How they're now responding to climate change. So I was kind of like inspired by Pierre's comments and then Simon's comments about um, advanced economy sectors. Are there ways that the COVID Okay, thanks very much. Um, so we're now closing in on the on the on the end of the session. Got a few minutes left. So um, really uh, ask the panelists to respond to those questions. And maybe sort of also wrap that up with your closing uh, closing uh, closing thoughts. So um, I think uh, the signal wasn't good, unfortunately, Monica, with your things. But I think particularly emerging economies. I heard um, Adam's questions about uh, Sweden and differential capital requirements, and then the sort of language of priorities in terms of capacity strengths constraints. I'm going to start going in reverse order. Um, so, um, Pierre, your, your your comments on these questions and final thoughts. Thank you. Um, and you um, just just a few a few comments on the Swedish uh, the, the Riksbank. Bank. Um, I think what is interesting here is that um, the Riks Bank started to introduce um, sustainability criteria in their own portfolio, so not in their monetary policy portfolio, and then came up with exclusion criteria. I think they excluded some provinces in Canada and, and, and Australia for, for climate reasons. So what is interesting is that it's not about not only about risk, it's also uh, a choice to exclude polluting. And, and what is interesting is that with COVID, they started uh, an asset purchase program. And, and now they are thinking about, or they announced that they will also integrate such a, a sustainability uh, consideration into their monetary policy portfolios. So they started with with own portfolio, which is something where central bank, a lot of central bank do also use these kind of principles. But then because of COVID, they started a monetary policy portfolio and then they extended their, their the criteria to this uh, to this monetary portfolio, and it's I think, as f to my knowledge, it's the, it's the only bank that uh, is not doing it yet, but has announced that they will have such criteria, which is interesting. In, in just for for Dorsen, in terms of priorities, for me, I think you you guessed it is uh, 
to introduce climate risk, to reflect climate risk in monetary policy operation, whether collateral or refinancing of refinancing um, facilities, and to reflect this risk and also in, in prudential regulation. Lovely. I think I think that, that progression you identified in the Riggs Bank is really an interesting example of sort of learning by doing. I think it's a very, very, very good example. Thanks so much. Danai, your, your closing thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Really good questions. I think on the priorities, actually, it's uh, the, the, the key policy that we need is not up to central banks. It's up to governments. It's a carbon tax, carbon pricing. I think that should be number one in terms of what central banks can do. Uh, I agree with, uh, with Pierre. I think it should be emphasizing the risk motivation for them to do something and and while they acknowledge that they're not properly pricing risk they should do something about that um so that's what i would say on monica's question i thought that's a really good question um because we are seeing central banks change as institutions because of this crisis and i think it's also interesting compared to previous crisis i think what we saw in the previous crisis was that they became much more in the they came much more in the public eye central bankers are now celebrities their household names they're no longer these technocrats that would tweak interest rates and kind of no one even knew about it or um didn't affect people's everyday life everyday lives and I think that's being intensified even more now. So as central banks become more active, uh, and the good thing that's no longer the only game in town as they were in previous crisis, because we're seeing fiscal policy move as well. But I think the links between fiscal policy, government debt management, and central banking are becoming uh, more more close. And there, you're now starting to hear all these fears about fiscal dominance and public debt is high, and central banks are in a trap. And I think all that discussion about central banks becoming more political will also influence how they will approach climate change and i think that's partly perhaps why they're being so cautious i think it's very very important that they are rigorous about this risk distinction and the alignment um, motivation with government policy and i think that's how they should approach it going forward can i thanks so much thanks for picking up on, on monica's uh, question um, so, Irene, apparently you're a celebrity now, according to Dana. You're a. Um, <laughs> it's like a your comments. Yeah, I never thought I would be as a central banker, <laughs> but that's. Uh, I think, in a way, it's a positive thing, and I think we have to live up to the expectations. So that's. Uh, and and uh, therefore, I want to thank everyone. You know, for motivating uh, central banks and supervisors to move forward on this thing because uh, if we would do it only by ourselves uh, we wouldn't move so fast so thanks so much for being like pushing us uh, on, on this topic and, um, and motivating us um, and I totally agree uh, with what Pierre said and uh, and also Danea that it's the risk angle we're, we're, we should be looking at and we sh we're, we, we've been quite focal on that angle and we tr try to emphasize that. And of course we need more information and data and disclosures on, but still um, uh, we can do a lot and let's see what we can do more. Um, on disclosures, I agree it only covers, of course, a bit, a, a sh not the whole market, but let's, um, uh, it's an important, Apart from the developed uh, 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 developed economies to, to work on that, um, yeah. Finally, I think for the priorities, I would say uh, let's let's look at the market neutrality more in detail and uh, the monetary policy side. I think for the prudential requirements, uh, there is work ongoing also uh, at the European Banking Authority and all other uh, authorities are looking into that. But I think the monetary policy market neutrality side is a bit more unexplored still, or that's where the, the biggest steps still need to be taken. Yeah, and no, I think that's, yeah. that's profound. And, and just a plug, I think uh, Pierre is too modest, but Pierre and his colleague did a very good uh, analysis of market neutrality more broadly within mm -hmm. monetary policy and obviously with application here to, to green uh, policies. So have a look at that. And uh, it's, it's an excellent, excellent piece. Um, uh, we, we're coming up against time, but I, I'd like to have a brief word, uh, Uli and Simon, from you, particularly in terms of what, what's going to happen next in terms of Inspire and the Toolbox. So Uli and then uh, Simon. Thank you. And, and, and thanks, everyone, for, for really excellent comments and remarks. And I wish we had an extra hour now. Um, so I, I think um, what, what, what the single most important thing that central banks and supervisors can do right now is really set out a clear pathway about 
uh, uh, kind of that, that will guide the financial sector. So uh, making clear that um, uh, uh, um, uh, climate related disclosures will become mandatory and, and uh, explicitly for large actors. So um, that all financial institutions will, will have to uh, disclose climate related financial risks and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, companies of a certain size or listed companies. Um, and of course, SMEs, that's a different story. Um, uh, so so um, the disclosure, I think uh, that's a no-brainer. Um, and uh, uh, as I said uh, in the chat, uh, I do think uh, uh, stress testing uh, also uh, needs to become mandatory. Uh, you know, there's different degrees of sophistication you can add to that, but, but um, uh, uh, and, and companies don't need to start, uh, or firm, uh, financial firms don't need to start immediately, but uh, central banks can give a little bit of notice, but, but just this announcement will already have an impact. Um, so I think these are two really low hanging fruits. Uh, I mean, we've, we, we have a lot of other different tools and obviously uh, in each jurisdiction, uh, you know, the physical and transition risks are different and, and uh, you know, kind of the, the traditions and approaches by different institutions also differ. I mean, we've, mm -hmm. we haven't really touched on developing emerging economies, but you know, uh, many have uh, financial systems that are very, very different from what we have in Europe. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, the policies uh, that will uh, be best suited will also differ. But so my, my main point is really giving some kind of forward guidance in a, in a climate risk related or kind of broader sustainability related sense, obviously biodiversity is becoming a really big issue now um, and, and uh, rightly so. Um, and, and just before I hand over for Simon for final comments, uh, we will have a second launch uh, of the toolbox for an Asian context uh, with Ma Jun, who's uh, leading the NGFS uh, research stream um, uh, on, on research, uh, and our partners at the CSEN Center in Kuala Lumpur, and that's going to be on 15th of December, um, 8 to 10 uh, CET, uh, but you'll uh, have the announcement soon. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Ali, and uh, yeah, look forward to hopefully some of you joining that. So that's going to be a really great session. So, Simon, maybe just a, a quick thumbnail sketch of what uh, Inspire plans to do next. Uh, for yes. the world. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think Uli summarized uh, the, the priorities very well in terms of next steps. So we will we will do further research on this and we will now get into the technical details of some of the proposed instruments. And this is also why this discussion here today was was very helpful. and and all of the panelists' comments and Torsten's comments on, on priorities. So this is what we will think a lot about, what, what can be the priority. A lot of research Inspire has already commissioned, for example, on collateral frameworks, there's a project uh, ongoing on, on asset purchase programs. There are, I think, one or two, maybe even three projects ongoing. So there's a lot already happening within the Inspire network, and we will see how to strategically expand this to make sure that the, the technical details that are needed on some of these instruments are provided. That's, that's fantastic. So stay tuned for that. And I, I'd like to respond, Monica, also to your question um, in terms of how, how this crisis could reframe the way we look at climate and other sustainability issues. Um, when Mark Campanile and I set up Carbon Tracker, uh, we did that after the global financial crisis. And before the global financial crisis, we could not conceive, could not imagine that climate change was a systemic risk for the financial system because we thought that the financial system was stable and tended towards equilibrium. And I think COVID will like, likewise reframe the way we look at these issues. I think particularly the, the speed and disruption of shocks, as we've heard today, but I think also the wider uh, social implications of, of, te of, of, of transitions and so on. Uh, and so themes around questions around uh, just transition will also come up. But I think it's not going to be a normal process and it's going to be our, our, our way we deal and, uh, with uh, climate change and sustainability and the way the central banks operate is going to be, um, I think, quite new in the years ahead. So thank you all for joining. Uh, thanks to our fantastic uh, panelists, uh, celebrities, experts and everyone uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you perhaps uh, on the Asia session on the 15th December. So thanks very much everyone and have a good day. Thank you.